Dr. Gary Kaplan, welcome to the Biohacking Secrets Show. Adam, thank you. I couldn't be more delighted to be here. I like that attitude. All right. We got a bunch of good stuff to cover. We're going to be talking about environmental toxins and uh, specifically environmental toxins that injure our immune systems and our brains. And you've got some big, you know, $5 words that we can teach our, <laughs> our listeners. So I'm sure they're going to be pumped about that. We're going to talk about how to, how to find, diagnose, and treat these toxins, chronic illnesses, chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic pain, post-COVID, post-Lyme, chronic Lyme and uh, repairing the immune system for optimal health. I I think it's going to be a good one. We're going to have fun. (laughs) We're going to hopefully get a whole bunch of people starting on their path to recovering and getting them healthy. I think so as well. And uh, so before we kind of dive into all that great stuff, for our listeners who might not be familiar with your work, can you give us a little bit of your origin story? Oh, good grief. So I'm uh, originally trained as an occupatic physician. I did my residency training at Georgetown, so I'm bordered in family medicine. I'm still a professor at Georgetown. Uh, and I'm also uh, one of uh, 19 docs in the country who's double boarded both in pain medicine as well as uh, uh, family medicine. I'm also an acupuncturist, and I've uh, a fellow of the American Academy of Medical Acupuncture as well. I run the medical center at um, the Kaplan Center, which I founded back in 1985. Getting older, uh, and uh, so we've been doing uh, we've been treating people with chronic pain, chronic illness for many, many years. I wrote my first book, Total Recovery, about six years ago, seven years ago. Uh, and that would happen. The really interesting thing where this started was I was attending the American Academy of Pain Medicine's meeting in 1999, and they said, you know what? It's a really spiffy idea to start treating chronic pain patients, benign pain patients, not cancer pain, benign pain patients with opioids. And thus began what we now know is Probably one of the worst decisions we've ever made in medicine. I was going to say that went well. Yeah. And but what happened was I went home and was starting to use the opioids and I was watching my patients seesaw back and forth between depression and pain. And I'm going, this doesn't make any sense. And I was very fortunate. I've done work at NIH. I had colleagues at NIH uh, and at Georgetown. And I pulled together a study group of psychiatrists and uh, neurosurgeons, neuroresearchers rather, and we met once a month trying to figure out what is this about? What are we missing? What is chronic pain? And ultimately, what we came to understand was that chronic pain was inflammation in the central nervous system. And chronic pain, I, I want to explain, is a different creature than acute pain or chronic acute pain. So you have acute pain, which is you slammed your thumb with a, with a hammer and it hurts. And there are specific pain pathways that get excited as a result of that. A chronic acute pain is you've got osteoarthritis in your knee. And if you're not using your knees, you're not running around, you're not jumping, you're not having pain. But if you are, you start to have pain. So that's re-injury of the tissue. And so that's a chronic acute pain. There's ongoing tissue damage. Chronic pain, tissue damage is come and gone. That time you hit your hand with your, your thumb with a hammer, your thumb still hurts six months later, but the injury is completely recovered. Why is that? Okay. And so chronic pain is pain in the brain itself. And that's what we were looking at. And we tried to understand how that happened. And we were looking at that from the standpoint of inflammation in the brain. And specifically, we focused on there's two big systems in the brain, in the body, the innate and the acquired immune system. That book, I was focused mostly on the innate immune system. And so we're looking at things called microglia that caused inflammation in the brain. And this was a whole new concept, this business that brain pain equals inflammation of the brain. And as we continue to develop that concept, and what we've learned since then is it's not just the innate immune system, it's also the acquired immune system. We're making antibodies, and you're now making antibodies where you're attacking your own brain. And this happens because an infection occurs, and it confuses and overwhelms the immune system. But there's a lead-up to that. The lead-up to that is you have either genetic predisposition, because 80% of people who get Lyme disease recover after a course of antibiotics. 20% don't. And so what's going on in that other 20% of people? And the answer is that what's happened is you've got a setup where the immune system gets broken, and this is where we want to get to with most people because this is where we can stop you from getting sick to begin with. Talking about diet, talking about toxins, talking about sleep, talking about exercise, okay? Talking about emotional traumas and addressing those. Then a problem comes along such as an infection, COVID, 
or Lyme disease or strep or any of a number of different infections. And the next thing that happens is the immune system breaks and meaning that as opposed to just attacking the bug that it was set up to attack, it now starts to attack our own tissue, specifically the brain. We now have an autoimmune disease tripped off by an infection that's attacking our brains. What does that look like? Pain, fatigue, sleep disturbances, focus and concentration issues, headaches, sensitivity to light and sound. So digestive issues, it can look like a thing called POTS, postpartostatic tachycardic syndrome. And that's where you go to stand up, and the next thing you know, you're falling down because your heart rate's zooming up to 150 just by the act of standing because your autonomic nervous system can't keep things in balance. You're having heavy sweats for almost no reason whatsoever. It can also affect the peripheral nervous system, and all of a sudden, you're getting weakness in your lower extremities. You're developing problems with sensory. And so there's a whole host of problems that can fall out from these infections that can be incredibly debilitating. Epstein-Barr in the case of of chronic fatigue syndrome in particular, but there are other infections that we take a look at. So this requires that we we step back and take a whole much bigger perspective on how you got sick, why you're staying sick, and once we know those things, we can help you recover. And we've got to get out of this mindset of treating symptoms. And this business of the six-minute office visit where you come in, you've got one symptom, that's all you're allowed to talk about, even though you've got 16 others, and the doctor says, must be depressed, here, take this antidepressant, go away. And all we're doing is, is disabling people, and we're creating a nation of really chronically ill, chronically suffering people that doesn't need to be. I totally agree. This this past summer, I went to Bad Eibling, Germany to do, I mentioned to you off air that that I've been blessed to have Lyme disease and Bartonella twice. And the second time around, I was like, I'm going to go to extreme whole body hyperthermia. They mm-hmm. heated me up to 107 degrees twice, you know, and, and then did, did an uh, antibiotic push while I was at temperature. And um, it was a great experience. One of the things that I found really interesting was in interviewing uh, Dr. Daus, who, Dr. Friedrich Daus, who runs the mm-hmm. clinic, uh, he had some very interesting perspectives. You know, he's this. He's helped yep. 25,000 people with cancer. He's helped 2,500 plus people with Lyme. The numbers are probably higher now. And he is of the belief that Lyme, here's, here's how I should phrase this actually, that multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, POTS, dementia are all partially or perhaps in some cases fully created by undiagnosed Lyme in the brain or Bartonella in the brain. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. So I think he's partially correct. I don't think it's all. And I think Mm. every time we say all, we start running into trouble. But I think unquestionably, we have seen Lyme mimic Alzheimer's disease. We have seen Lyme mimic amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. We've seen Lyme mimic Parkinson's disease. The thing all of these diseases that you just mentioned have in common is inflammation in the brain. So Mm. for instance, If you have lots of beta and tau tangles in the brain that we see in Alzheimer's, look at it as a marker of Alzheimer's, okay? Mm -hmm. It turns out that you can have lots of those and not have Alzheimer's. But recently, there have been studies that have been done looking at microglia, which is the main innate immune system in the central nervous system. If the microglia are inflamed and kicking out lots of inflammatory molecules, then you'll have Alzheimer's. Mm. So it really is all about neuroinflammation. And Mm. same thing we're saying, we're looking at the association between Epstein-Barr virus and multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, we want to know what is it that tripped off the inflammatory process? Because I don't know that it's the bug itself, and Bartonella needs to be mentioned in there also. It's another possibility. So it's Mm -hmm. not just Borrelia, which is Lyme disease, but Bartonella is another tick-borne disease. Yeah. So we absolutely need to be very thorough in making sure these infections are not present and we need to treat them. But ultimately, the problem comes down to a two-step. The infection itself, but then the infection which has injured the immune system, and the immune system is now turned on our brain. So sometimes we get rid of the infection, and the immune system quiets down, and we're good. Other times, that's not what happens. And the end result is that the immune system is broken and continues to attack and inflame the brain. Example one, post-COVID syndrome. Mm -hmm. Post-COVID syndrome, the bug is gone. There is no evidence of persistence 
of COVID in people who have long haul COVID. But there is plenty of evidence that the immune system itself is damaged. And we've been looking at things called cytokines, which are inflammatory particles, proteins that are put out by different uh, cells in the body, inflammatory cells in the body. And inflammation, by the way, is not a bad thing in and of itself. We need it. It's what keeps us alive. It's what kills bugs. It was, keeps us healthy and repairing. But too much of it starts destroying our own tissues. And that's where we run into problems. And so in the post-COVID syndrome, we've identified uh, a certain type of white cell that has been damaged by the spike protein and continues to spew out inflammatory particles. And it does two interesting things to this white cell. It One, it interferes with the mechanism of the white cell dying. So the white cells should only live about five, seven days. This thing continues on as a zombie cell, and it keeps spewing out all of these inflammatory particles. So we can identify that pattern using cytokine diagnosis. And this is a blood test that we can do in cell diagnostics at the labs we go through. And we can uh, then prescribe medications that shut that process down and allow you to completely recover your health. We've treated a large number of people with post-COVID syndrome with very, very good success. So this is, and, it, and this is brand new breakthrough stuff. We are just getting ready to publish a paper on this, looking at cytokine profiles also in uh, patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and patients with post-Lyme syndrome. And it turns out there are different patterns. So this is allowing us to get much more, you know, the problem is we throw everybody in a pot, right? You have post-Lyme. That's not true. There's lots of different manifestations of that, and we have to be specific in treating it to get you the best possible result and the best opportunity for recovery. So there's a lot we can do by identifying which infections are the problem and treating that infection, and then if necessary, treating the immune component of that as well. So yes, I think that uh, there's a large number of people improperly diagnosed, missing the diagnosis of Lyme disease and Bartonella and other tick born diseases uh, that are mimicking things that look like Parkinson's and MS and uh, dementia. Uh, and I think that the other part of the problem is damage to the immune system that's creating that problem. So I think it's twofold, not just one. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I also was was able to kind of identify a curious pattern in, in, in myself that I'm, I'm, I'd like, you know, your input on. Um, I was dealing with a lot of physical pain and, and inflammation in my body. And now naturally, you know, having been bit by a tick and experienced experienced Lyme, I was like, well, is, is this Lyme resurfacing or what's going on? And I've been blessed to have on, you know, neurosurgeon Dr. Jack Cruz and R. Blank, whose dad wrote o o the book Overpowered, Nick Pino, who wrote the non-tin foil guide to EMFs. So they got me thinking a little bit about population density and the amount of these this wireless electricity that's in our ambient environment, right? And I was living in Chicago. 25,000 people per square, per square mile, you know, place like that. And my back pain started getting so problematic. I said, you know what? I'm eating as good as I can eat. I'm being consistent with my exercise. I need to test my environment. So I jumped in a car and I went to where we're building in North Carolina, which is 14 people per square mile. I set up a tent in the woods, camped by the river. Within three days, my pain was gone. And it stayed gone the entire week. Came back to Chicago, pain came back. Went back to North Carolina, pain went away. Came back to Chicago. And so I'm talking to a couple of, of, of my uh, friends who are physicians, and they go, that ain't Lyme, buddy. They're like, Lyme wouldn't just go away when you drive to North Carolina. And and I'm, I'm, I'm curious, like, so I've, in myself, and I've, I've repeated it now a dozen times, and, right. uh, and, and found ways to mitigate it to where, um, I can, I can live, you know, pain free here and feel good. But I'm wondering, is that on people's radar even, you know what I mean? Is it something that, that your clients are paying attention yeah. to? Cause people that are in pain so often, they're just scouring the internet looking for, you know, they're, they're on WebMD and they're reading blogs and listening to podcasts, but they're on devices all day essentially potentially aggravating their their nervous system and creating inflammation through an, an energetic wireless electrical pathway. What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are that you're absolutely correct. When we have people evaluate their houses for mold toxicity, they're also evaluated for EMF. Because the fact of the matter is we live in an incredibly EMF polluted environment. 
and EMF does damage. There are plenty of people who are extremely sensitive to it, such as yourself, where you can pick up that damage in real time. But the reality of the matter is, I think long term, we're going to have to find out that we've created a lot of chronic diseases and a lot of chronic problems because we live in so much. It's not just air pollution, which there's plenty of. It's not just the poisoning of our foods, which is plenty of. But it's also very much a problem uh, with EMF, where we have uh, polluted the environment electronically, and that's having impacts on our on our bodies. No one has any business sleeping with a cell phone next to their bed or any other electronic. Certainly don't have your router in your bedroom. Uh, uh, you should have your house checked for EMF. It's worth spending the money and seeing or buying a meter and seeing what's going on in various houses because you don't want to be subjected to that all day long. You also want to be paying attention. You and I are sitting here on screens, but even the light frequencies that we're using on these screens are not good for us. And yeah. we should actually be wearing blue blocking glasses, and I tend to wear them when I'm at home. I got this giant I got this giant interrogation lamp on me to, you know, to illuminate my face and it's it just feels uh intrusive. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we have to we have to be attentive to this stuff. Uh we have to live in the real world, but the reality of the matter is we can make it as safe for us as possible. We can do that by taking our phones and taking our electronics, putting them outside the bedrooms. Yeah. Making sure we don't have our routers sitting in our bedrooms. Checking mm -hmm. and or turning the routers off at night. Yeah. God, God forbid we should actually be disconnected for 12 hours. What if, what if you need to search the internet while you're sleeping? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Skills so, to develop. <laughs> so we really want to be increasingly intentional about how we're living. We mm -hmm. want to be intentional about where we're living and what the pros and cons and benefits are. Yeah, I agree. And, and we're going to do a deep dive on the environmental toxins that you're seeing a lot at the uh, Kaplan Clinic, kaplanclinic.com. In, in just a moment, I'm going to kind of kick us off with uh, a short, short story and a question. So right. years ago, this this wasn't even on my radar. I had a lovely woman who was working with me as an assistant, and um, she just went radio silent. And after like a few days, you know, we talk every day, multiple times a day, and then also I'm not hearing from her. And after a few days, I finally get a hold of her and she said, hey, um, Anthony, and I'm going to use I'm going to speak very carefully here and, and try to keep it. The audience will know what's going on. They're savvy enough. Um, she's I, I, I took my daughter in for some shots and one of them was the MMR. Mm -hmm. And she goes, my daughter is, is now autistic. And I'm like, what? And she goes, she goes, she's almost two years old healthy. I took her in. She got the shot. She's not making eye contact. She's not smiling. She's crying all the time. She goes, huge change in my daughter. She goes, I, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I'm freaking out. A week later, she had to quit to just take care of her daughter. And that, for me, got me looking deeper in that space as a potential source of toxicity, you know, environmental toxins that we're putting inside of our body. And I, I know it's a bit of a sensitive subject, so you feel free to to, to just pass if you want. <laughs> um, but like that that story for me was like, mm -hmm. hold on, what's going on here? You know, if, if something like this could happen, um, and I'm a little curious what what are your thoughts on that as a source of toxicity that we're we're starting off with, you know, at a very young age. Um be brief on this one because it's yeah, not yeah. my area of expertise in terms of uh, vaccines. I think without question, you can have uh, uh, bad reactions to vaccines. And I think you have to weigh the benefit risk in terms of the risk of getting the vaccine versus the risk of getting the disease. I think there's a lot of genetics we don't understand yet. And that as we get better at genetics, we're going to be able to say, okay, this vaccine is good for you. This one is not. Mm -hmm. And so as we get closer on that, uh, we're going to be able to uh, get more specific about who we're treating and uh, who it makes sense for and who we're going to potentially damage. So we need to be very careful uh, about getting more personalized in our medicine. And that will happen uh, as we get better with our genetics. And we will avoid creating problems such as just happened to your friend. Now, I will also say that we have to look at what the potential setup is. So the potential setup is fairly significant. So the question is, what did her gut microbiome look like before she got the, the injection? What did what was her environment like before? Had she had prior issues with infections? 
because I have a 10 year old young woman who comes into my office who is per perfectly fine one day and the next day uh, she has obsessive compulsive disorder, rage attacks, uh, she's regressing in childhood uh, and the parents are going nuts. This unfortunately was six years earlier when this started. And what happened to this child was she's treated as a psychiatric case. She's subsequently uh, hospitalized because of cutting behavior. She developed suicidal ideation. Now imagine the, the, the self-esteem damage that's been done to this poor child as a result of being told she's crazy. In fact, in her case, the problem was that she had Lyme disease and she developed what's called PANS, Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Syndrome. So in her case, the infection set off an autoimmune reaction that attacked her brain, the end result of which is she ends up uh, for six years being told she's crazy. And we've now treated her and she's subsequently doing dramatically better. So there's a lot a lot of things you have to take into account. Are there prior, is, is the child's immune system perhaps challenged by mold toxins that have been in the house? Right. So that the immune system itself is weakened, and then these, then you go ahead and you give these vaccines, and the next thing you know, you've got massive problems. So there's a lot that has to be looked at, genetics, epigenetics, these environmental factors, in addition to the precipitating agent itself. Let me give you another way to look at it. You buy a condo in this lovely building in Florida. You spend a million dollars renovating the penthouse. And it's absolutely gorgeous. The views are magnificent. Everything is spick and span new. You didn't bother to look at the basement and the garage. And the next thing you know, the whole building collapses. Remember that happening? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. That's a warning for all of us. If we make the outside look gorgeous and we haven't taken care of what's sitting in the basement, we are potentially setting ourselves up for disaster. So the uh, basement, are you talking about the colon? I'm, I'm talking about uh, <laughs> I am absolutely talking about the colon. I am absolutely talking about the colon. It works, I'm, right? It absolutely. Work. I'm talking about I'm talking about the colon. I'm talking about childhood stressors. If there's been child abuse, much higher risk of developing autoimmune diseases, much higher risk of developing heart disease, much higher risk of developing obesity and diabetes later in life. Child abuse is a big deal. It's neglected. It's not addressed often enough. And it's absolutely crucial for us to lead a long, healthy life that those issues come to the fore and be addressed. And it's not just pushed off to the side as, well, that's for the psychiatrist that has no impact on your health. There's a huge impact on your physical health, and that needs to be attended to. So we're looking at all of the things, you know, what are you feeding your kids? What, you know, and what potential problems are you creating uh, by not paying attention to diet, not paying attention to exercise, not paying attention to your sleep? Mm -hmm. Sleep is crucial. And so if we're not paying attention to the basics, then we're setting ourselves up for bigger problems. Genetics absolutely positively has to be factored in there, but we're just, we're still learning and things are accelerating so that in the next 10 years, everything is going to be different. We'll be doing genetic analyses on you first. We already do genetic analysis on most of our patients so that we can assess their ability to tolerate different medications. But the uh, we're not there yet where we can really get drilled down and say, okay, you're going to be at risk for this. This bed's not good for you. This food's better for you. This is not good for you. There's a company called Biome. No mm -hmm. financial connection with them whatsoever. But Biome is a nice way to actually look at the gut microbiome, that second brain that's in our gut that's made up of bacteria and uh, molds and parasites uh, sitting in our gut that actually need to be there and help determine the health of our gut. And so they're looking at, at the gut microbiome. So biome is their name. You can order it online. No financial connections. But I think they're a good company. I think they're doing good things. Discount code, Dr. Support. Gary Kaplan. I wish. <laughs> I wish. But I think they're doing good things. And yeah. I'm always in favor of promoting people who are out there doing good things. Yeah. And so uh, they're doing good things and helping us have more insight into ourselves, more insight into how healthy we are and how we can get healthier. And so we need to be paying attention to all of that at every single step of the way. And if we're going to, what do you want to talk about? You want to talk about diet? You want to talk about sleep? You want to, you tell me, we'll, we'll mold, pick it. I have, I have 
two questions leading up to that, and then we'll go okay. into uh, um, the first is like on the genetic side, right? People yes. people are becoming increasingly aware of like MTHFR and, and methylation issues and detoxification and the production of of neurochemicals and that sort of thing. COMT, um, your yep. a a APOE status. What are like some of the key genetic drivers that you see? or HLA, right? Like some of the key genetic drivers that you see most often correlated with mystery illness or chronic and degenerative conditions that you're testing for. You know what I mean? Like, hey, we got to see your APOE status. You know, what is it for Dr. Gary? Right. So APOE is certainly one of the things that we take a look at. So APOE uh, 4.4 uh, is a much higher risk in terms of, sorry, <laughs> much higher risk in terms of developing Alzheimer's and a much higher risk of heart disease. I think peace with it. But there's lots, but it's it should be. So look, celiac disease. 30 to 35% of the population is genetically at risk of developing celiac disease. Mm -hmm. Of that 30, 35%, only 3% of people will ever have celiac disease. Mm -hmm. So genes are not destiny. Genes right. are suggestions. It's what, ha what do you do with the environment? What exposure do you get that ultimately trips off the problem? OK, mm -hmm. the warning is, OK, look, I'm at risk here. So that means I've got to make I got to take especially good care of myself in terms of looking at this. So APOE 4434 are the two highest risk in terms of heart disease and in terms of dementia. So those are we absolutely look at that on everybody. I'm a three three. The, oh, now, you're, now you're just hot dog. Hey, man, listen, <laughs> this stuff is as applicable to me as it is to anybody else. Yeah. We're all in this together. Right. It isn't about, you know, I tell my patients many times, the beauty of my job is I get to tell people things often enough that I eventually hear them. Yeah. Because these lessons <laughs> are as important for me as they are for anybody else. It's okay. We're all in the same boat here. Right. Uh, MTHFR. MTHFR is extremely important. It is the gene that allows us to convert folic acid into methylfolate. Methylfolate is necessary for a healthy brain. And if MTHFR is deficient, there's four SNPs that we take a look at, two contributed by each parent. And so if there's a problem with converting that, one way you may see it is an elevated homocysteine level. Mm -hmm. So if your homocysteine level is particularly high, you probably have a problem with metabolizing methylfolic uh, acid. So looking at methylfolate is an extremely important, uh, MTHFR is an extremely important gene. After that, it's a lot more complicated. There's a lot of different genes that we're looking at, and we have to analyze a whole array of things, looking at what drugs you metabolize, what you can't metabolize. The HLA typing is another challenge, right? So I had a patient who came in the other day who was HLA B20, B27 uh, positive, and so she's been told she has ankylosing spondylitis, except that she doesn't. She doesn't have Lyme disease, but she doesn't have ankylosing spondylitis, and there's no X-ray evidence. You know, she's told, oh, well, you're X-ray negative ankylosing spondylitis. No, you don't have ankylosing spondylitis. And in fact, the joint pain you're having isn't just in your back. It's in your wrist. It's in your elbows. It's in your shoulders. It's migrating around your body. Ankylosing spondylitis doesn't do that. Lyme disease does. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to be very careful just because the gene is there, the HLA typing is there, is, is that's not 100% true. We used to do... HLA typing, uh, looking at whether or not you were at risk for development of Lyme disease, uh, not Lyme disease, I'm sorry, mold toxicity. I no longer do that because what we have found over time is that that in and of itself isn't enough information for us to buy, determine whether or not you're going to be mold toxic. So we actually now have a way of measuring the mold toxins in the urine directly, and that's a much better way of telling us whether or not you have a problem. And then we can go treat, and then we can look in real time whether or not you're getting better or not. The HLA typing, it's not been confirmed in other studies. I'm a studies guy, right? I've done work at NIH. I've done work at Health and Human Services. I teach at Georgetown. I need, I need to be able to talk about the research, and I need to be able to speak to whether or not, and where we're at the edge versus where we're on really solid ground. I have no problems pushing the edge of what we know. But I want to make sure we're still talking about science as opposed to, you know, opinion. Uh, and I'll specify when I'm, I've organized an opinion on something based on the research I've done as opposed to, no, no, we've actually got very strong connections uh, that have been demonstrated in the literature. So the book I wrote 
used over a thousand references in the process of putting that book together. Okay, yeah. all from all from PubMed, the scientific literature. That was probably a party uh, putting those together. <laughs> no, the party was reorganizing all of that literature, which was taking up three rooms in my house. And my wife finally <laughs> put her foot down and said, "This needs to go away." And so much uh, experience <laughs> with additions. You got to build more rooms for all the books and literature. <laughs> so uh, I then got a research assistant to come in and scan everything and put it in, in properly electronic format. Well, so, thank you for doing that. <laughs> papers away. Yeah. So, uh, so the book that I wrote is based on the science. And there may be disagreements about it, but that's okay. We're here to discuss those, but let's discuss it based on the science, not based on opinion. And there's too much that happens in medicine that's based on opinion, mm -hmm. not based on the facts. And I've seen too many people abused by my colleagues because they hadn't read what needed to be read on the condition. I was, I was on the uh, advisory committee of health and human services where uh, myalgic and cephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome for four years. We helped advise uh, health and human services how much money to be allocating and what kind of studies to be doing on MECSF. Part of the job was listening to a day of testimony of patients, and they were heartbreaking. People who had been told they were faking, people who had been told they'd been just trying to get disability, people who had been completely dismissed and abused by their profession, by, by their physicians. And I'll tell you a great book to read that I think should be required reading in every medical school in the country, which is a Women of Mysterious Illness by Sarah Remy. Again, I'm not making any money on this. Sarah is a friend. I will grant that. But I think she's written a brilliant book that talks about her journey of trying to get diagnosed and the, and the challenges she's had dealing with the medical profession uh, and the abuse, unfortunately, she suffered uh, at the hands of docs who didn't understand what the hell they were looking at. And... So this isn't an unusual problem. And, and the problem is that increasingly our profession is being taught to diagnose and treat according to what insurance companies think are the right answers, not according to what the medical literature is the right answers. Mm -hmm. And we have huge battles going on, especially in Lyme disease, as you're all familiar, uh, about what should be treated and what shouldn't. And in fact, Ross Dupthup, who's a conservative columnist for the New York Times, recently himself had Lyme disease, wrote about it in the Times and wrote about it in a book. Because guess what? Here's a guy who believes in science and here's a guy who's completely into the conventional medicine. And he ended up going down the rabbit hole of chronic Lyme before he could get sick and get better by people who actually understood Lyme disease. Your, your book that you were referring to, is that total recovery? Or I know you have... You have more than one. Yeah, the first book was Total Recovery. This book, uh, Why You're Still Sick, is all about everything we've just been talking about. And more importantly, this book is a self-help book. This book is a step-by-step -step guide as to how you can, what testing to do and how you can recover and how you can talk to your physician so you can be your own best advocate in the midst of this. So it has patient stories in it. It has specific labs that we use. Again, I've got no financial interest in any of these labs, but they've used them over the years. We've checked them out so that we know we believe the information we're getting back. Okay? And so, and I'll give you an example of how insane things can be. There's one test that we do, which is a bit fancy, but it's a uh, meth hemoglobin test. Okay? Because what happens is sometimes the red cells stop being able to carry oxygen around the body. That happens in carbon dioxide poisoning. It turns out that LabCorp and Quest were more than happy to do this test for us, except that the test has to be run within four hours. The tests were never being run in four hours. Their own lab directors said that they had no business doing the test. And in fact, the results they were giving us back were bogus. I don't understand why this isn't fraud, and I don't understand why somebody hasn't in fact sued them. For I was just thinking charging, that. Charging for these tests, when in fact they have no business running them. Their own lab director told us this. Wow. So this is the problem you have. You have to understand the limitations of your labs and you have to understand this is complex stuff. Mm -hmm. Getting a diagnosis of Lyme disease from LabCorp or Quest is equivalent of a flip of a coin. That's how insensitive the Western blot is. Mm -hmm. 
You need labs that are specialized and much better at diagnosing this. And there are labs. Igenix is one of the labs we use. Vibrance is another lab that we use. And again, I've got no economic interest in any of these labs. I am interested in getting the right information in the right in everybody's hands so that they can get the right diagnosis and they can actually get better. Yeah, that's huge. And the and the book you mentioned that you said should be required reading, is it Women of Mysterious Illness? Yes. Sarah, Sarah Remy, R-A-M-E-Y. R-A-M-E-Y. Awesome. Okay, thank you for that. Um and then you mentioned something that I don't want to glaze over, but I, I think at least just pointing people in the right direction. We talked about child abuse and, and you know, what goes along with that is, is sexual abuse and trauma, right? And a lot of people know they've had these things, but they don't necessarily know what to do about it. What have you seen as, as effective implements or interventions when, when those are present in helping someone to heal? So that's an extremely important question, and it's a unfortunately an over uh, typically neglected issue basically there's a lot of specialized therapy now that's been developed in order to help these people recover so the first thing is cognitive behavioral therapy can be helpful uh, and can be a place to start but using things like emdr is a specialized technique which can be highly effective neurofeedback can be another technique which can be highly effective in helping people recover from trauma uh, transcranial magnetic stim, which is a process where you're, you actually are exposed to very high energy magnets, uh, can also be effective in helping people uh, with post-traumatic stress disorder. So there's a lot of techniques that can be utilized. Acupuncture can be helpful in uh, helping a lot of these people process these kind of problems. If you're in an environment, our center is set up so that we have a therapist who specializes in trauma. Uh, we do acupuncture. We're looking at how all of this stuff is stored in the body. And so we're looking at how do we pull this stuff out so that you can completely heal. I remember one woman I was working on, I was doing manual therapy on her. And I had my hands on her. I was doing some cranial sacral work. And I go, Jesus, who are you so angry at? And she broke down and started to cry. And she said, my father. And then this whole story came out in terms of neglect and abuse and so we have to be sit and listen. We have to take the time, which is the other thing is you can't do this in a six minute medical appointment. You have to have the time to listen, build trust with an individual so that they can begin to talk to you about their story. So you can begin to hear people need to be seen, heard and respected. And that is something our medical profession increasingly does poorly. If, if you were to describe, so there's there's the, tradi the traditional medical paradigm, right, where doctors are constrained to 7 to 20 minutes. And like you said, it's very difficult to listen and even get the diagnostics that are required in that amount of time. So let's say that's like the old paradigm, right? And what what do you what's your vision for the future? If, we, if you want to call it like doctors, doctor 2.0 you know, medical system 2.0. Can you paint a picture for, for the other physicians and medical professionals out there of like what what reality, what new, what new paradigm we need to step into in order to better serve our fellow brothers and sisters? I think the very first thing we need to do is we need to completely reimagine the insurance system. The mm -hmm. problem with the insurance system as it's designed is that the ideal medical office, the ideal hospital, according to the insurance system, is empty. Why on earth do they want you to get sick? Because it costs them money. So we don't have a wellness-oriented medical system. We have an illness-oriented medical system. We want to keep you out of the system as long as possible until you collapse. And then we'll have to pay for you. And then maybe we'll pay for you and we won't. So we need to shift to an entirely different system of wellness medicine. We need to shift where we're talking about... Uh, Talk, getting people in to see, and we can probably do this, by the way, with nurse practitioners and physician extenders. Uh, not, we don't necessarily need uh, physicians doing this job. I think a lot of the other thing that's going to happen is using AI in order to be able to, I, to take all of the data about your genetics and about your epigenetics and design an ideal program for you. So I think bringing AI into this is going to be extremely important as we get better at what we're doing. And then when it comes time to sit down, you need to be able to sit down and have a conversation. My intake interview is two hours. My follow-up interviews are anywhere from 45 minutes 
to an hour and a half, depending upon what the patient needs. Unfortunately, that means I can't be in the insurance system. So we need to be able to reorganize what we're doing and understand what these illnesses are. So we've also got to get away from this business of treating symptoms, fatigue, chronic pain, headaches, sensitivity to light and sound. These are symptoms. Mm -hmm. They're not diseases. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to back up and say, okay, what's the underlying cause? And that means it's going to take time to sit and listen and get the history. And we're going to have to look at, are there toxins? We're going to have to admit the fact that we've soiled the nest. So I had a woman come in the other day, chronic fatigue, chronic headaches, What's going on? Well, I'm taking a history, and part of the history is uh, what's your diet like? She's eating tuna fish sandwiches every day. Okay. The FDA says we have no business eating, if you're pregnant, you have no business eating tuna fish more than twice a week. Why? Because the mercury content in canned tuna fish is so high that it's dangerous for the fetus. Well, how come it's not dangerous for us? Mercury is a toxin. Mm -hmm. And this woman, in fact, had mercury toxicity from eating all the damn tuna. You might want to let some dentists know that mercury is a toxin, too. Another major problem. The dental fillings uh, are, and we've all already seen evidence of uh, association with uh, dental fillings and MS. Mm -hmm. Highly controversial, but nevertheless, I think the evidence is strong enough to say, you know what? If you've got lots of amalgams in your mouth and all those silver fillings, uh, I think there's an argument for removing them. The ADA says, no, there is not. In Canada, they say absolutely there is. So it's this battle going on between politics and what's ideal for our health. Mm -hmm. The other part of the problem we have is is genetically modified seeds. There's and the a whole controversy. Pesticides. That's the problem. Yep. And herbicides. The yep. problem is the genetically modified seeds are geared to be resistant to the herbicides and the pesticide. So that increases crop yield. Good thing. Bad thing is they take up the herbicides and they take up the, the pesticides into the plant itself. And guess what? It never gets processed out. It ends up in your Cheerios. Herbicides and pesticides turn out not to be good for us. So we have 1% of the population that has celiac disease. That's an autoimmune disease. You eat gluten and you you can have all kinds of massive problems in your gut, in your brain, in your nervous system. Very serious disease. But we have 6 to 18% of the population, which is glucose intolerance. What does that mean? Well, I think in no small part it means that what you're really intolerant to is glyphosates. Because I have plenty of patients who cannot, including my wife, who cannot eat gluten in any way, shape, or form in this country. Go to France, where they don't allow GMOs. She can have baguettes, she can have croissants, and not have any reaction, because those are not filled with herbicides. So we're soiling our nest, and now the new thing coming up is it turns out we're getting microplastics and everything. We've soiled our nest, and increasingly we have to be very mindful and very careful about what we're eating, because we're damaging our gut microbiome. We have to be very careful. We think... You have a headache, take Advil. Well, let's talk about Advil. If you're taking Advil on a regular basis, okay, everybody thinks about stomach ulcers, which is truly a problem. But the real problem is taking any anti-inflammatory medication for extended periods of time, 65% of those people will develop ulcerations in their small intestines. All right, you won't feel it, but what you may get is gas, bloating, you may find that you're having constipation or diarrhea. And guess what? Because of those ulcers, you've got leaky gut where you've got nutrients passing or large molecules of food passing into the bloodstream. And the body looks at those and says, that is something that we shouldn't have and makes an antibody to it. Now you're allergic to a whole array of foods. And increasingly, more and more foods are bothering you. And the reason that is, is because your gut is leaky, not healthy. Guess what? If your gut ain't healthy, your brain ain't healthy. You need a healthy brain to have a healthy gut, and you need a healthy gut to have a healthy brain. And so it's extremely important that we get that basement that we were talking about earlier 
healthy, strong, vital, so that our brains are healthy, strong, and vital as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things we have to pay attention to. Living in the modern world, as you have now discovered, now moving to North Carolina, out of Chicago, ain't so easy. And Mm -hmm. we've got to be very careful about what we're doing so that we live an optimally healthy life because I think legitimately we can live well into our 120s healthy and vital. And Dave Asprey, a a friend of mine, says you make it to 170. He may be right, but you got to take care of yourself today. You've got to do all your homework today. And by the way, one of the best anti-inflammatories for the central nervous system, exercise. Exercise needs to be an increasingly important part of your routine on a regular basis. Sleep. Most people do not pay attention to their sleep. They don't get enough sleep. They get too much sleep. Too much sleep is also a problem, by the way. They get, (coughs) or they're getting interrupted sleep. They're having trouble falling asleep. They're taking all kinds of pills in order to fall asleep. Insomnia is one of the major diseases of our generation, of our times. Plenty to worry about. So how do you quiet that down? And that has to be addressed as well, because without getting good sleep, it impairs your immune system. And it impairs your ability to function day by day. I'm curious. So, the, I mean, this this idea of we've soiled the nest. I completely agree. I, I jokingly call it the great poisoning that we've mm-hmm. sort of created, and, and and that some of these companies have created. I mean, what what's our way out? Right? There's uh, there's a, a company that's so big it, it rhymes with man saint go. <laughs> And they're putting these herbicides and pesticides in everything, right? right. And, and they have almost no recourse. They're so big. It's kind of like, what are you guys going to do? You know, do we need class action lawsuits? Like what starts to put these companies in check and ho- hold them responsible for their behavior when there's such a vast amount of clinical and scientific data uh, supporting the dangers of what they're putting in our food and environment? <laughs> First thing you need to do is change your consciousness. And there's an easy way to do that. And where are your lungs located? In my uh, chest, my torso. Okay. What do you breathe out? Carbon dioxide. Can you breathe and live on carbon dioxide? Can you, like, could I just breathe carbon dioxide in with no oxygen? Right. I don't think I'd last very long. No, you wouldn't. So (laughs) who breathes in carbon dioxide? It breathes out oxygen. Plants. Yeah. Your lungs are not just in your chest. Your lungs are in the trees and plants, the algae. We are connected to this planet, and we need to understand that there is no separation, and we need to quit acting as if there is. And that by making, looking at a tree and going, wait a minute, that's the other half of my lung, and starting to think in that way. And now we're going, okay, What do I want to put in my body? How do I want to behave to the environment? Is it a really good idea to be cutting down the Amazon, right? So these are things we have to pay attention to, and we've got to pay attention to them in a great big hurry, by the way, because we're on the clock. We're watching global climate change occur at an increasingly rapid rate, and we we don't have the models to predict exactly what's going to happen and what that tipping point's going to be. We're looking at, at sheets of ice the size of states dropping off into the ocean. Okay, well, that's all pure water, all right? So that decreases the salinization of the oceans. As you decrease the salinization of the oceans, you change the ocean currents. Well, now all the weather patterns are gone. And so all bets are off, and we don't have computer modeling that'll tell us what's going to happen when that happens. So we've got to be more conscious of what we do, and we have to live mindfully, thoughtfully, intentionally. And we yeah. change what our pocketbooks. What are you buying? Who are you supporting? Every time you go out and you buy a product, who are you supporting? Mm-hmm. You have a choice here. You can make healthy choices. You can make choices to buy things that are not processed, and you can make choices that are things that are good for your body. And, and recognizing that everything that we consume, if you, in, in an overly simplified worldview, is that everything that we're buying and consuming came from the earth. It, it was Correct. extracted from the earth, and then you know change form and then and then so being more frugal and intentional and conscious with our consumption and just everything that we buy is a key part of this that's taking less 
from Mother Nature and, and the other half of our lungs, as you so eloquently put it. Absolutely, positively. So it's about paying attention also to ourselves and watching the early warning signs. Mm -hmm. what, are we waking up rested or not? Are we waking up multiple times a night? Are we tired all day long? By 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you need to be pounding down coffee in order to stay awake for the rest of the day. Are you having headaches and aches and pains that you're ignoring? Uh, you know, we put up with a lot of stuff. Is your digestion proper? Are you having bowel movements every day? Are you getting bloating, gas? Are you having low-grade nausea with things? All right? So we have to pay attention to ourselves mm -hmm. and get in our bodies and not ignore our bodies and not make the body the enemy, but make the body, this is where we live. Mm -hmm. And so how do we attend to this in such a way so that we're taking care of ourselves? Mm -hmm. Are we eating foods that are good for us? Are we in, in environments that are good for us? You've got very clear that being in Chicago is not a good place for you to be. You're extremely sensitive to EMF. Mm -hmm. Thank God you have the ability to get out of that environment. Mm -hmm. And so we need to pay attention to this. One of the things that I also am is your house filled with mold. Right. Right? That's a massive problem because mold toxins, about 20% of people can't process them. The end mm -hmm. result being that they get poisoned by them. And mold is poison to both the nervous system and the immune system. So there's lots of stuff that we need to so test yourself. Find out whether or not these are problems that you have. And in the book that I wrote, we give you access to the labs, a lot of which you can do the testing on your own, and you don't need a physician to test. And that's why you're still sick. That's why you're still sick. Exactly. <laughs> and so It works. It works. I want – there are easily 20 million people in this country alone suffering and struggling that don't need to be. And I am on a mission to help every single one of these people recover. One of the research projects we're looking to do is to look at kids who are in the juvenile detention system and kids who are in uh, psychiatric institutions and find out how many of these kids are sick. How many of these kids have infections that have been failed to be diagnosed, that have mm -hmm. an autoimmune process going on that has failed to be diagnosed? And we want to find out how many of those kids are sick because I see enough of them in my office. I had one kid come in who had attempted to hang himself multiple admissions to psychiatric institutions. I'm a neuroinflammatory guy. So I said, okay, let's see whether or not there's something that's inflaming his brain. One of the things that can do that is celiac disease, right? Mm -hmm. an, autom autonomic, <clears throat> an autoimmune disease to gluten. 5% of people with celiac disease will present only with neurologic problems. They won't present with any digestive issues. So if we think in terms of brain inflammation, and then we start ruling out the things that can cause that. We found celiac disease on him, got him off gluten, got his gut completely repaired. A year later, he is off all antidepressants 100%. And he's been that way for the five years that I've continued to follow him. Nice work. So you got to ask the question. And I think at a minimum, 25% of those kids sitting in, in psychiatric institutes and uh, juvenile are actually sick. And I think that it may be as high as 45%. But that's why we need to do the studies. We need to get the data. And we need to get it out there so that we're getting the care these kids need and all of us need in order to recover our health and have optimal health and live really vital, healthy lives. That's why I wrote the book. That's why I do the research I do. That's why I organized an international uh, symposium that we had in February for physicians uh, on, if you'll excuse the expression, autoimmune encephalopathy of infectious etiology. This is everything we're talking about. This is infections that break the immune system and cause the immune system to attack our own brains. So <clears throat> hopehealingknowledge.com is a website where you can have access to that conference. And so hopehealingknowledge.com, the whole conference is there. It's cost, I think, $125 uh, to have access to it. But we want people to have this information. And we're getting this, the proceedings of the conference published in peer-reviewed journals. I've I'm, I'm got to educate my colleagues. I've got to educate the public. We have to make changes. And the only way we'll do this is by taking the knowledge that's there available to us and getting and use, putting it in place so that we can get healthy and we can fully recover. So I want to stop you from getting chronically ill to begin with. And if you are chronically ill, I want to help you have a path forward in order to be able to have a good, 
productive, wonderful life. I love it. Well, thank you for doing what you're doing and, and, and being such a pioneer in helping to educate your colleagues and share this information with people that need it to, to ease the, the suffering that so many men and women are going through. Where, um, I, I have one more question before we kind of land this plane, and then you can kind of tell everyone where the, the Kaplan Clinic is located and, and do you work with people outside of, uh, of you know, your area and, and that sort of thing. The last question is like, if you have, if you had like your big three or your big five tests, you know, when someone comes in with chronic stuff, right? <laughs> Headaches and fatigue and, and malaise and pain, you know, you've talked about Lyme and Bartonella and the Igenix test and some other ones there. You've talked about mold, which I would imagine might be like a mycotoxin test where you're seeing the urine, yep. maybe maybe having them get a Hertz V2 test and, and measure their environment and seeing if there's mold there. We've got heavy metals. We've got food allergens. What are your like big five where you're like, I can, I can figure out what the heck is going on with someone who's been suffering if I have this data, these data points. So the big five is unquestionably mold toxicity testing. So doing that uh, either through real-time labs or in Great Plains. Uh, doing testing of the gut microbiome, uh, looking at that with uh, the Great Plains organic acid test or using uh, Genova uh, stool testing. Three-day three stool test from Genova? Yep. 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 So using that testing. Uh, if appropriate, doing the Igenix test or Vibrant test to look for tick-borne diseases becomes important. And then doing basic testing of in, uh, with Quest or LabCorp, you can take a look at, you know, what's your blood count, what's your uh, liver and kidney functions, what's your thyroid function, what's how's your immune system function. We measure subcategories of IgG. We measure what's called a serum protein electrophoresis. We're doing what's your CRP, your, which is a measure of inflammation in your body. We want that under one. So these are the kind of tests that you can do, you can get access to, and get pretty quick information as to what's going on inside you. Heavy metal testing also can be done. Uh, you can do that sometimes through Quest or from LabCorp, uh, but other times uh, Doctor's Data is a nice lab uh, for doing some of that test. Do you like provoked uh, or unprovoked? I've been using less provoked recently, uh, but I've done both. Um, Joe Pisano has kind of convinced me to use unprovoked testing uh, of late, uh, but I think there is a place for provoked testing as well. We are giving chemate uh, to see whether or not that draws out the heavy metals. Interesting. What was his reason for unprovoked? He's, yeah, I don't want to speak for him, but my understanding is that you want to see what's floating around in the blood, and that's more important to you than necessarily what's locked into the tissue. So Makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, this has been a, a fantastic, illuminating conversation. I've had a lot of fun with you, Dr. Gary Kaplan. Um, for people that you met, so you mentioned hopehealingknowledge.com, where they can go and get access to that uh, event that you put on and the information that it, that it, it provided. Um, tell us a little bit about the Kaplan Clinic, at, which is at, at kaplanclinic.com. And guys, if you've gotten value from this episode, share it up, like send it to friends, family members, coworkers, anyone who's suffering and needs help has been, you know, has been dealing with something that they haven't been able to figure out. There's a lot of wisdom here. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Gary Kaplan, so you can share how people can stay up to date on all the cool things you're working on, future books, how they could work with you in your clinic. So the clinic is kaplanclinic.com, and we're a multidisciplinary team. So we have uh, several physical therapists who sub specialize in things like cranial psychotherapy uh, and uh, comprehensive body work. We have an acupuncturist and herbalist on staff. Uh, we have a psychotherapist on staff. Uh, we have a nutritionist on staff. Uh, and then the physicians uh, and a nurse practitioner. So my own background training uh, is in manual therapy, in osteopathic training, also conventional medicine, uh, as is uh, Dr. Lisa Lillenfield, my colleague, uh, and Hapreet, my nurse practitioner. So <clears throat> we've got a comprehensive crew uh, working on this stuff. By the way, as long as people are listening, we're looking for another nurse practitioner to join us, and we're looking for another physical therapist to join us uh, because the, the center is expanding. Uh, and we have a hell of a nursing staff. So one of the things that happens is we understand in dealing with people with chronic illness that they need a lot of support. And so we have somebody answering the phones 24-7 in order to be able to provide that support to our patients. So we have a phenomenal nursing staff we have a phenomenal front desk staff. You pick up the phone, somebody answers the phone, you're not sent into 
phone message hell trying to get responses. Oh, boys, so we're nuts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we're a high touch practice. We also have a foundation, the Foundation for Total Recovery. The Foundation for Total Recovery was one of the sponsors with Georgetown of this conference uh, on autoimmune encephalopathy. And so the Foundation for Total Recovery is there also to fund research efforts uh, on this behalf and uh, is, uh, is the thing that will be funding the study to look at these kids. So we need help. We need support with the foundation. So we want to get information out. We have a newsletter that we put out. The book itself is a wonderful place to start. So why you're still sick, this is a self-help book. This is putting what we do in the center in your hands so that you can begin the process of self-healing. You can begin the process of taking optimal care of yourself. That's why I wrote the book. There's only one of me, and I'm out on these podcasts and out doing interviews because I want medicine to change. I want people to be able to get healthy. There's a lot of people who are sick that don't need to be, and we can have a better path forward for them. So there's Absolutely. grounds for hope, and this is exciting. It's very exciting. And this has been such a wonderful conversation. The last thing I I'm going to ask you just as we kind of finish, when it comes to insurance companies and what needs to happen there, is this is this a business opportunity for any of our entrepreneurs and, and business-minded folks who are listening? Do we need to change the existing companies or do you see that we need we need some new companies to step up that are more preventive, preventative and, and health-oriented rather than trying to get companies that are already a part of this system to change. I think there's a massive opportunity for disruptors to get into this field and do it differently. So, uh, yeah, I think I think the old insurance model doesn't work. It's broken. It's really leaving us very sick and uncared for. And I think that somebody's got to come up with a new model and there's no incentive for the old model to change because they're making too much money. So thank God there is insurance. But at the same time, we need radical disruption here. And I think this is an unbelievable opportunity for some really smart entrepreneurs to get in here and make changes. I agree. Thank you so much, my friend. This has been a great conversation. I really appreciate you sharing your energy and time and wisdom uh, and, and all the work that, you, that you're doing to uh, to, to build a, a better future for, for our, our, our fellow man and, and woman. Anthony, thank you so much for being on the show. And I want to say one last thing. If you go to KaplanClinic.com, you can pre-order the book on the website. We'll give you the first chapter and we'll also give you an ebook on uh, treatment for post-COVID syndrome. So we want that information in your hands as soon as you can get it, but the book will be available on uh, Amazon for pre-orders starting uh, the second week in May and will be uh, fully released on June 14th. So, All right, guys. I hope it if you got if you got any value from this episode, go and get Dr. Kaplan's book and uh, it, you know at kaplanclinic.com. Feel free to reach out to his team. They're, they got people on the phone twenty four seven to help you. And uh, again, Dr. Gary Kaplan, thank you so much. I had a blast. Andy, I had a complete pleasure talking with you. Thank you for the privilege of being on your show.